Calgary, it's uh, very cool for me to be here today to speak to all of you. A lot of people look at me and think of me as a pioneer in hockey, in women's hockey. But I'm not a pioneer. These women were pioneers. As far back as the late 1800s, women's hockey was documented uh, being played, and right here in Canada. Lord Stanley Preston, the Governor General of Canada, and hence the Stanley Cup, his daughter Isabel was one of the first filmed and photographed female hockey players in this country. In the early 1900s, when the men went off to war for World War I and World War II, some smart entrepreneurial businessmen decided that it would be great to keep the hockey spirit alive in this country and have women play. And so the Eastern Ladies Hockey League was formed, and they called them lady hockeyists. I can't imagine being called a lady hockeyist, but they were. <laughs> and so these women played every Monday night across the eastern seaboard and filled ranks of up to 3,200 people and entertained people during the wartime. You could argue back then that women's hockey was more popular then than it might be today. Now, when the war ended and the men came back from war, women's hockey sort of died until the 1960s until another group of pioneers came along and inspired someone like myself. But that's not my story. This is my story. Just a little five-year-old kid growing up in Shaunavon, Saskatchewan, who watched my mom and dad hang out at the rink, because that's all there really was to do in the little town that I came from. They were school teachers, and my dad played old-timers hockey. And I watched him play, and one day I said, well, I'd like to play. And luckily for me, I had two parents who believed that a girl could do anything that a boy could do. And so, yes. <laughs> and so they put me in the game. But the story of my childhood was a little different than the average boy growing up in Shaunavon, Saskatchewan. When I was five and six years old, the narrative for girls playing hockey in my town and in the world, really, was girls don't play hockey. And luckily for me, there were two reasons why I played. My mom and dad, who sheltered me from a lot of the abuse and the criticism that was dealt my way, and the fact that in a very small town, you needed warm bodies to fill a team. <laughs> and so they were happy to have me. When I got a little older, um, it was a little tougher. I was changing in places like boiler rooms, the back seat of the car, the bathroom stall while moms from the other team would chatter about the girl on the other team. And it wasn't easy. When I became a teenager, the narrative changed again. Now here, you see me in, this was 1998, 1999, I was attending the Philadelphia Flyers development camp because in the 98 Olympics, when I was 18 years old, Bob B. Clark, who was the general manager of the Philadelphia Flyers, watched me play in those Olympic games. He liked the way that I played, and he invited me to camp. But just three years prior to stepping into an NHL-level camp, I was playing midget AAA hockey right here in Calgary. And I tried out for the team on the boys' side. I believe I'm the only girl that's ever made a midget AAA boys' hockey league in this city since. And I, and I played. And 15 games into the season, we went on a road trip to Medicine Hat, Alberta, and I had a really good tournament, maybe one of my better performances at the time. And I was very excited about solidifying myself on the team, being part of the team finally. And when the bus pulled up to Father David Bauer Arena in Calgary, the coach called me into his office. And I thought he was calling me into his office to say, you know, great job, I'm gonna, gonna put you on the power play now, or whatever it might be. But instead, he looked at me in the eye and he said, you know, you're a really good hockey player, but I can't handle having a girl on the team, and so I'm going to let you go. Oof. So there I was, <laughs> standing in Father David Bauer Arena while my mom was waiting in the parking lot for me to come out and tell her how great the tournament was. And when I walked outside and I opened the car door and my mom said, so how did it go? I heard you played really well. I said, I just got cut. And the look in my mom's eyes at the time, I'll never forget it, because I remember as a kid growing up all the times that my parents had protected me and sheltered me from the things that I had to hear and had to go through. 
And instead of getting irately mad or flying off the handle, she just looked at me in the eye and said, are you sure you want to keep going? Because this is getting really hard to watch. And so felt pretty sorry for myself for a few minutes and definitely it was devastating. But something inside me, which has always driven me in my career, said, bucket. Buck this. <laughs> and so I realized that talent alone wasn't going to get me anywhere in this game that really talent alone isn't going to get anybody anywhere. No one owes me anything. No one owes any of us anything. I was going to have to figure out a way to keep alive in the game. And so I realized at the time that I was overcoming this giant bucket list. And on my bucket list, <laughs> which is not your traditional bucket list, I did not want to jump out of an airplane or climb Everest. No, I was actually bucking it. And the things that I had to buck were things like gender. Girls don't play hockey. Well, guess what? 100,000 girls in this country play hockey right now. Yeah. <laughs> tradition. The tradition of hockey is very steeped in the male-dominated world. Very difficult to overcome. The fear of failure. Because for me, as a young girl, failing was not an option. And it wasn't an option because it was the only way I was going to belong. I put an intense amount of pressure on myself, and I was intensely afraid of failing. And the status quo. The status quo was very hard at the time. No one stood up in that midget AAA organization and said, this is not right, even though I made that team. And lastly, don't rock the boat mentality. Because sometimes it's easier to just sit back and do nothing than to put yourself out there. Now, I want you guys to all close your eyes for a second. And I want you to imagine you're in your high school parking lot. And two kids, two boys or two girls, it doesn't really matter, they're about to fight. Now, do you see a crowd of people around these kids? Chances are you, you probably do. Now, what if that crowd wasn't there? Would those kids still fight? What if one kid in the crowd decided to step up and say, this isn't right, and break up the fight? What might happen to that kid? Because the reality in today's world is that the herd mentality is really dangerous. And the world needs less sheep. And by less sheep, I mean, if you imagine sheep, what happens when sheep go in a herd and they follow the leader? They do anything that the leader does. And sometimes that means even going right over a cliff. And don't we see that in today's world over and over again? When I became an adult in the game of hockey, the narrative changed from, as a teenager, you're a girl, you're pretty good, we don't want you, to now what are we going to do with you? Because not only was there me playing hockey, there was a whole slew of other women in Canada and around the world with their bucket lists, and now we had a national team of women playing hockey. And I have to say, in what other country in the world would you see an image like this and know that that was a bunch of women on the ice and that they were able to play the game? I think the world needs more Canada. <laughs> but the narrative change and the establishment didn't like it. The Hockey Canada's, the Hockey USA, Swedish hockey, you name it. They were uncomfortable with a bunch of women that had demands and wanted to play the game and actually might actually want to get paid for playing it. What were we going to do now? But the thing with the bucket list is that you don't just buck it to be cool or be a rebel about a, without a cause. You buck it because there's something wrong. People are being persecuted. They're not getting the opportunities that they should. The status quo isn't OK. And I'll give you three examples of where the status quo wasn't OK. Martin Luther King Jr., the 1960s, he changed the way that we look at civil rights today by civil disobedience and peaceful protesting and inspired millions around the world. Warren Buffett, who 
the richest man in the world created the giving pledge and chose to give away 99% of his wealth, inspiring over 30 other billionaires like Bill Gates and Elon Musk to do the same. He decided that the disparity between rich and poor is too great in this world, and he did something about it. And the last example, and the most recent example, is the USA women's national hockey team, who just a few months ago decided to buck it and buck the status quo by fighting for a pay raise. They were getting paid $6,000 per year per player from USA Hockey. And with a massive media movement and 18 US senators writing letters and a host of other people around the world supporting them, they went from a pay raise of $6,000 a year to $70,000 per player with bonuses. Pretty impressive. And super inspiring, and it's gonna make it much easier for any other female athlete in any other sport to get paid one day. And so for me, although my life in hockey is, is over as a player, uh, the next path that I hope to blaze one day will hopefully be a career in medicine, and maybe someday as a doctor. Now, the cool thing about me standing up here telling all of you guys that I want to be a doctor is that probably none of you thought to yourself, wow, she wants to be a doctor? Maybe you thought to yourself, oh my god, she's so old, why is she going to medical school now? <laughs> But I hardly think many of you thought she wants to be a doctor. And the reason why is about 100 years ago, there was a woman named Emily Howard Stowe. And she decided that she wanted to be a doctor. And she became Canada's first female physician. She bucked it. She bucked the status quo. And so my hope for all of you today when you leave is that if you don't already have your own bucket list, that you make one. And that the next time you're in an environment where someone says you can't do something because of your gender, your race, your religion, your sexual orientation, or, 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 that you stand up and you say, bucket. Bucket. Thank you very much, Calgary. Have a great day. Yeah.